Hey everybody, it's Rob and we're back at Scorum and I got some great, great news today. I'm not doing the haircut. <laughs> Jason is now. Jason is one of our team of scumbags and he is absolutely amazing. We got a lot of questions about why don't you ever show fades anymore? Well, I am not in the fading phase at the moment. But Jason here is an absolute master when it comes to doing skin fades. Skin fades are very, very popular in our shop. But um, I thought I can do one, but why not show you the best? So with no further ado, brrr, Jason! Hey! Huh? I'm Jason. Uh, we're gonna be doing a yeah, skin faded scumbag boogie. This is uh, probably, if not the most popular haircut in the shop, the second most popular. I would say this haircut's popularity can be attributed to the fact that not only is it a very traditional haircut in a lot of elements, but it's also a very modern haircut in a lot of elements. It's one of the more classically inspired haircuts rather than classic haircuts we do in the shop. It has all the elements of a classic haircut when it comes to squareness, it's working away from the face, it's got a parting. But some of the more modern elements are the cuts. There's actually a bit of asymmetry in the front with uh, the side of the parting rounding up over the head. The, uh, the skin fade on the sides is not very classic as well. And then we're gonna be rocking it with quite a bit of volume today, as you can see. The hair naturally has a lot of lift, especially with a bit of color in it. Well, let's get uh, right into it then. When I start the haircut, I always start with looking at the shape of the skull especially for a haircut that contours to the shape of the skull as much as a scumbag boogie does. So before even wetting down the hair, it's important to look for the occipital bone, the parietal ridge, and the different growth patterns on the hair. So in Martin's hair, we've got an occipital bone. It's not too high in the back, it's pretty flat. This is a, such an important one to check because we all know that moment when someone has like the split in the occipital bone and you bring the fade a little too high and you always are gonna have that dent in it. And you look for the parietal ridge here and then this is the wide point where you'll see where the haircut, you can already see it even uh, before I cut the hair, goes in a little bit there and it stays low here. You check for that wide point behind the ear, that's gonna dictate the squareness, where the apex is, and then you can see the hair is naturally falling into the shape. So I'm not too worried about the crown or anything, but it is uh, located right in there. I'm gonna go in, we're gonna wet the hair down with thorough dampness. This is really where you should already be starting to see the haircut. If you can see the haircut at this point, you should be getting excited because this is very good. Now that the hair is thoroughly damp, I can check to see what I'm able to comb the hair into because anything you can do with water, I'll be able to do with a bit of product. So even as I'm combing it, I can start to see that volume coming through in the front and that there is that really strong parting on the side. So then the next step of what we're gonna do is we're gonna section up the top from the sides. Uh, some people like to work one side at a time and then the other. Some people like to work with the full top. Personally, I like to take the whole top into a section. Uh, but if you prefer doing it one side and then the other, it doesn't change the haircut, it's just a comfort level. So you start where the head naturally starts to round. Take your section and just push it up working towards the back. Now, even if there's a parting, I always like to take the whole top up at once because then I can very easily establish the symmetry. So this is not being taken from the natural parting, it is being taken from the round of the head. And then just the same thing on the other side. This is a great way to start with balance in the haircut immediately because it's very easy to check because you haven't done one side and then you do the other side and you go, oh, you know, crap, I'm a centimeter shorter on this side. I gotta go back and do the whole other side again. Because I like that this is a very easy way to work through both sides simultaneously. There we go. And then, depending on the shape of the skull, you can leave the back in a few different shapes. If it's got a very low occipital bone, you might wanna leave it in a point in the back, like a V shape. If it's got a higher occipital bone, rounding the back might be a little bit more natural just to follow the shape of the haircut. 
but that's totally a preference thing and that's very dependent on the growth pattern as well as the shape of your customer's skull. Perfect, so now that that's all sectioned up, we're gonna be starting with the baseline. When I'm doing a razor fade, I do the haircut, the, the baseline a little bit different than I would if I was doing a long trim or a tapered cut. As opposed to lifting it 90 degrees out of the head, away from the parting, I like to do a slightly lower baseline. What I find makes this work better for the razor fade is because you always have some dents and bumps in the skull. And if you connect the wide point, that occipital bone to the parietal ridge, you make sure to leave that length long enough that it covers the dents, it stays dark so you can fade underneath them. So you get a very smooth fade, a very even fade with no dark spots without compromising the haircut and having those, those going in and out of the haircut. You still get that smooth silhouette as well as that smooth fade. So I start at the back on the occipital bone with my clipper on the head, balance right on that occipital bone, but keeping the comb square because I want the haircut to lay square. And I'm just setting in my first baseline. Step. And I'm pivoting the same way you would, taking the baseline usually. I'm just keeping it a bit lower so I can save some of that length. So this is where you can already start to see there's a bit of a dent in the skull here, it ripples. And by following from wide point to wide point, I make sure that I have, I'm gonna be able to get this nice and even on the face. So I'm working from the occipital bone to that wide point at the parietal ridge. Going back just to double check my work so far. Excellent. And now I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side. So I'm starting here, nice and square. Step. 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 You can already see the shape that that fade is going to take on the head. This is to make this is a great way to make sure that your your fades really tailor to the shape of the head and really accent the way the rest of the cut's going to lay. So now this is where a scumbag bogey gets re gets really interesting. It's right now in the back. We have symmetry. But the thing that makes a scumbag boogie special is in the front, you actually have asymmetry along the hairline. So on the side of the parting, I'm gonna go up over this widest point on the head towards the hairline. And on the other side, I'm gonna stay square walking around. So I'm gonna start here. I'm gonna follow it up. 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 Just like that. So that parting is now meeting the front hairline. Now to keep the cut connected on the other side, I could not do that because you could see that this is, would undercut in the front. So what we're doing is we're going to stay square to the haircut, the same as if you were doing any of the other haircuts on the poster. I'm take that away. So now you can already see the baseline of the cut. There's still a few little things in there, but I like to at this point go in and clean it up with scissors because I can take it really exact. I'll go in with the scissors, I'll go in with the cutting comb. And I'm not gonna pick the hair up, I'm just gonna go from that parting with the teeth of the comb into my fingers and just take off that little edge that's created. I'm just gonna do this working around. You really shouldn't be taking off too much hair here because you just set this in with the baseline. It's just any of the little hairs that maybe didn't fall into the comb, a little unevenness in the baseline. It's really just a cross check. And this is with very low tension. I'm just resting the hair between my fingers. If you put too much tension or you elevate too much, then you're gonna get a, uh, a ledge. You're gonna get a little graduation between where the line you cut here and then however high you elevated it to. On this side. Hey, Jason. Yes. You're doing an amazing job, man. Thank you. No, I really, you are very, very good with explaining shit. Thank you, I only so speak English. So from today on, you are gonna do all the videos. Oh no. So I have even more time off. <laughs> And 
then this, just get that littlest bit of hair. Excellent. So that's the baseline. This is where I'm now going to connect this into the top. That'll be the next step is uh, the connection between the top and sides. So we're going to connect the top to the sides. So we're going to go from this wide point behind the ear and we're going to follow this directly up to the apex on the head. But what's very important is when you move from one section to the next section is that you always re-wet the hair all the way down to the roots. Because if I was to do the rest of the haircut with this parting dried in, that parting would be present in the dry hair, it would be present in the styling, it would completely disrupt the haircut. Especially because the scalp and the head gives off warmth, so the hair at the roots is going to dry quicker than the hair on the ends. So you have to make sure to re-wet everything so none of those partings dry back into the hair. So once everything's re-wet, you want to make sure that all those partings are worked out. You can kind of shake them out as well. If anyone's done a roller set, they're familiar with this. And now we're going to be tracing from that apex to the uh, bone behind the ear and the apex from the bone behind the ear. Just down and forward. This is splitting the crown area of the haircut through towards the front of the haircut. And now in the crown, there are a lot of different ways you can work depending on how the crown is laying in the haircut and the final shape you want for the haircut. So in the crown, you can leave it a bit more square if you want for, to go for a very classic, very strong square shape. This is also a great trick to use if the crown's very jumpy because you're saving a little bit of extra length. But especially when I'm doing a razor fade, because I don't want to leave too much weight at this uh, baseline connection, I like to round it a little bit just to make sure that there is some graduation inside the cut. And even when doing an asymmetrical haircut, even when doing a parted haircut, I always connect the whole crown area. Because when the customer looks in the mirror, they're gonna be able to see towards their ear, but not really much past that. So you wanna make sure that this back of the head is as easy to style as possible. They can comb it to the left, the right, they cannot comb it at all, not put any product in it, and it will just fall balanced and even because you can guarantee that they'll be able to get the front a little right, but I mean, it's a total guessing game for them when it gets to the back. So now that I've got this area sectioned off, I remember where my original baseline was. So I'm gonna take a section just a little bit above that, and I'm gonna connect all of this hair down to that original baseline. But I'm going to not bring it all the way back down to the head. I'm gonna give it a little bit of a lift just so that that line does not get too heavy. This little bit of graduation is gonna save us time when we get to the blending. You can see that little bit of lift. I look for my original baseline. I can take this hair off. I am over directing the hair slightly as well towards the, uh, the sides of the head because I wanna make sure to save the length in the back so it's still nice and full over the occipital bone. This is a great fail safe to make sure that you never compromise on the silhouette of the haircut by going too short over that occipital bone. Check for the original baseline. I cut Martin's hair about four weeks ago, so we're not gonna be taking too much off, especially in, it's uh, 35 degrees right now in the Netherlands. So especially when you are looking for razor fade models in this heat, everybody just got their haircut. I'm just connecting it all in. It's good to cross check yourself so make sure to go over that line one more time, staying in front of that second knuckle. Just a nice straight line. And then we're gonna take another section, just a little bit above that, and we're gonna lift this one even just a little bit higher. How high you lift these sections is, again, it's dependent on how square you want the back of the haircut to lay, and it's dependent on where that crown is lying. If the crown is really strong and it's low, you wanna keep these sections low. You wanna keep this as heavy as possible. If the crown is a little bit higher, if it's a bit softer, then you can take a little bit more weight out of the back just because the crown is not going to be giving you so much trouble when you try and comb the hair over it. And then once you have completed this, make sure you're still, uh, you're moving with your work as well as you want to be standing directly in front of it because let me show you what you end up with. If you stand here and you cut this line and then it looks straight, but when I stand here, you see immediately that it actually graduates out. So you have to make sure that to get that line even, it's directly in front of your sternum the whole time and you're moving with your work. You're taking a step, you're combing towards you. You're taking a step, you're combing towards you. 
Body position is huge when you're doing haircuts because body position makes it so much easier to create squareness and it really lets your, work, your hands do exactly the work you're looking for them to do. I mean, we all know that rule with the flat top is if you're gonna cut a flat top, you have to stand square. That's true for every haircut. And now we're just gonna repeat this exact same thing on the other side. I'm gonna take that parting just a little bit above the baseline. We're going to lift it out of the head. We're going to look for that baseline. We're going to take some hair away. Okay, so now I've combed all the hair back, we've cut the back, and now we, again, because we had a section in there, I'm gonna wet the hair a little bit and make sure that section's removed. So now we're gonna move over to the connection of the front to the side. So now this is where it's gonna be a little bit different on both sides. Because on one side, we have a high parting, and on the other side, we have an actual connection. So I'm going to pull out the parting here. It's easy to find, because Martin likes to have the parting shaved in. I'm gonna take this parting, and I'm just going to connect all of this hair to the parting. Again, the same as when I did it actually in the baseline, we're just gonna loosely comb that hair between the fingers and just take a little bit away here. Baseline. Take this, and there you go. Just check it. Perfect. So now we have the parting side. That's all connecting in. And now on the other side, let me turn it off. We're going to be connecting the top, this front portion, to the side here. So you can already see that that parting is actually still a bit dry in there. So we need a little bit more water. And we're going to take out, we're gonna follow, we followed this hairline for the first parting, so we're actually gonna follow this hairline now for the second parting. Because this is really where that lift and that style of the haircut is gonna come into play. Because when you comb all this down and you comb all this back, this could be a slick back, this could be a pompadour, this could be a scumbag boogie. This is where that style is gonna come into play. So we're gonna take all this hair out, and this section is actually tracing not only along that front hairline, but it's connecting to the apex of the head. So this section is pretty much just from these corners to the apex, takes all this out. If I was doing a symmetrical haircut, I would have done the same thing on both sides, but because of the asymmetry of the scumbag boogie, we're working a little bit differently. And now I'm gonna take another parting. So I'm gonna comb this back a little bit and I'm gonna see how the hair naturally tries to open up in there. And from this corner, from the corner where the two hairlines meet, so I'm not taking anything out of the top, I'm gonna to take another parting where the hair naturally wants to split. This is hair that's naturally gonna to wanna to fall down when I'm creating the style. So to get this to lay nicest naturally for him, I'm going to comb all of this hair, the same as on the side of the parting, in between the fingers, and just connect it. And I'm doing all of this in vertical sections, or sorry, horizontal sections. I'm not doing this in vertical sections because I'll create a little bit of a wave in the hair where it meets that baseline, which will give it a little bit of flow back. So I'm elevating it a little bit to connect it into that elevation we put into the crown, but I'm leaving it really nice and heavy along the front hairline. So that this just gets a nice bit of flow towards the back. This next section, we're going to pull down, and this, we're going to disconnect a bit. So this length here, I think is good. I don't really want to take too much off there because I can see that this is already flowing towards the back really nice. So I'm going to keep that length in the front, and I'm going to take away all of that. Let's take that away. So when it lays down, when you comb it really flat to the head, you have the disconnection. But when the hair lays in its more natural movement, you're going to get a totally blended look, but you save this length in the front now so that you can slick all of that towards the back. And now we're gonna connect this front in, and we're going to take a section from about the middle of the front hairline over the ear a little bit. So this is where that 
disconnection started with the front section. So we're gonna just connect it in to that little bit of disconnection. We're not looking for the baseline here, we're looking for the disconnection in the previous section. Just like that. And then another section. That's taking the whole of the front style now in. We're gonna lift this up just a little bit, just to soften it. And take all of this in. Perfect. Just like that. It's so important that you make sure you get those teeth on the parting when you're combing these. Because even though we're not doing it with super strict, super precision, we're leaving this a little bit looser, you still have to make sure that all of that hair is in the line because if you leave a little bit of hair out, you're gonna see that later in the cut. It's gonna interfere. Get all of that over. So now we are moving from the connection of the sides to the baseline into cutting the top uh, and connecting that into the sides. So we're gonna start with a profile section now. We're gonna go from just the middle of the hairline. A great way to judge the distance on this section is you really just kind of use the space in between the eyebrows for it. Take that, we're gonna take another one. This is also a very nice way of making sure that it's right in the middle. And we're going to look for that length in the crown, and we're just going to connect that in to the length on top. We've got to work with here. Take all that off. So it might look really fine on the ends here. But that's just because it's such a small section. Just to create a guideline. We're just gonna take another parallel section now. And we're not gonna over direct all the way to it. We're gonna be just a bit in the middle of the two sections just to start to create some squareness on top. Just taking a bit off. Taking a bit more. Depending on the style you're going for, you can leave more or less length in the front as well here. You can take your section like that. You can take it just perfectly square. It totally depends on the style you're going for. It really depends too on the hair you're working with because when you're working with very jumpy hair and you want it to slick back, you know you want to save as much length as possible. But if you're working with hair that naturally has a bit of wave to it, Using that wave will create a lot of natural volume in the cut. And it'll make it really easy to style the hair. So I'm not leaving the top too long because I want to make sure that this is very easy for Martin to comb himself. Also, it's a, a short style. Like, it's completely shaven on the sides. So if we leave the top too long, it's going to be totally out of balance with the sides. And even if it is styled, it's going to clearly be completely out of control. Excellent. So now that that's cut in, we're just going to cross check, pull the hair up, making sure it's even. On this side, you're going to see a bit of rounding it, of it rounding down, just because it connects. While on the other side, it stays square to save a bit of length on the side of the part. make sure that there, we're not leaving any weight in the haircut that doesn't need to be left to get it into style. See, there is a bit of length in there. There we go. Cool. So now, the top and sides are cut, and we're going, or the top and the connection are cut. We're still working on the sides. But I like to do the fade in dry hair. Because the hair in the connection and the hair in the baseline is gonna move around a lot when it dries, if I fade it and then I go back into the haircut, it's going to have to redo the fade anyways. On top of this, if I dry the haircut now, the patron already has something really exciting to look at in the mirror when I start doing the fading process. And the fading process, depending on the method you use, it's probably not gonna look very nice halfway through. It's gonna look very half-baked. So if you, have, you start with a really nice style on top, and then the, the patron's very excited, and then you start doing the fading process, they're gonna give you a little bit more trust, which means you can have a little bit more leeway when the haircut's looking a bit iffy in the middle because there's all these lines and stuff on the side. 
So now we're going to be moving into drawing there. So I'm going to be using uh, some of my favorite Rizzle products to dry the hair. I'm going to be going for the grooming tonic in the big professional bottle and the fiber gel. I like to use these two products together because the grooming tonic, it's got some hold, it's got some pliability, it's got a very natural finish. Uh, it gives a little bit of a natural shine, it, I, and I like that pliability. But what I like with the fiber gel when you add it in, because the fiber gel, it's got a little bit of alcohol in it, it gives the, the grooming tonic a bit more dryness, a drier feel, but it's also a lot stronger. So if you put a little drop of this in with your grooming tonic, you're gonna get maximum control out of your blow drying. It's also gonna give the hair, just, when you feel that in the hair, the hair's not gonna feel like there's anything in it, it's just gonna feel really nice and full. But take a bit of the fiber gel, you wanna make sure, actually that was a bit too much. You don't wanna use too much, because when you dry it in the hair, you want to make sure that you can still move the hair around a little bit. So a little bit of the fiber gel, and just top it off with some grooming tonic. You make sure, too, that you want to mix them in your hands, because if you mix them in the hair, you're going to end up with areas that are just fiber gel, areas that are just grooming tonic. But when you mix them in your hands, you're going to have that really even solution to work through the hair. Make sure especially that you're getting it all the way down to the roots. You don't want to just kind of slop it on top because you do not need a lot of control in the ends. You want that control coming from the base of the hair. This is important for every style, but it's especially important for high volume styles. Work it through. Clean your hands off and we're going to be moving towards the blow dry. Excellent. So now we're going to be going into the blow dry on the haircut. I've got the grooming tonic and the fiber gel spread through the haircut. I've done the top of the haircut technically, all with precise cutting. So I know that the hair is going to fall pretty much like this on its own, which is a good style. It doesn't have the volume of the, uh, it will with the blow dryer, but I also haven't done any texturizing. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the shape of the haircut in with the blow dryer. So I'm going to be really trying to give a little bit extra volume to the front. I'm going to be making sure the sides are laying in the right direction because I not only want to see what the hair is capable of doing on its own, but I want to see what the hair is capable of doing with a little bit of product in it. So I'm going to be going in with the hair dryer. I'm going to be using high force, medium heat, and a little bit of low force with toggling between the heats. And I'm going to be using my Denman styling brush. This is really so that I can set that strong shape in, keep that crown nice and flat, keep some lift in the front, make sure to get that parting in the right place. So I'm going to be adhering to the natural fall of the hair, but I'm going to be enhancing the shape of the cut that I put into the hair. So I'm going to be starting on the side of the parting, just making sure to work that hair over so that parting is set in. Now I'm just working through to dry the crown, and you can see where that symmetry is so important because this is all already starting to blend on this side the same as on the other side. So one of the most important things to be looking for in the hair as we work towards the front of the cut trying to create volume is you want to make sure when you get into the hair, when you look at the way those roots are naturally growing, that you grab the hair and you pull it in the opposite direction and then lift it. So now you can see that it's coming straight out of the roots. So when I pull the hair up, I'm gonna be able to get the shape of the cut really standing up. So you see the hair is growing that direction. So I grab it, I click, and I lift. And I'm able to get that hair staying straight up at the roots. And that's gonna really create the most volume. really going to help that hair pop up. See? Grab it. Because you want that straight lift. And this is not only just important when you're creating a lot of cut in, uh, in like a scumbag boogie or a pompadour, but this is so important when you start drying like a flat top or a psycho, trying to get all of that hair up, is you have to be watching for that fall. Excellent, so now that we've got the hair dried, we're able to see a little bit more of what the haircut's going to look like once we've both done that fade on the sides and we've blended the top in. We're also now really able to work with our texturizing to make sure that the texture in the haircut enhances the color rather than detracts from it. Because, and this is very common when you're working with colored hair and you cut your straight lines, is you get chunks where there's the difference between the natural hair and the colored hair. So we have to make sure when we blend the haircut, we're not only blending the actual length, 
but we're trying to enhance and work with the color of the hair. This is, I mean, super important in the summer where people get so many natural highlights through the top. This is also really important when you're working with people doing fashion colors in their hair. Because how do you fade, you know, dark growth on the sides with a bright pink top? A lot of that is how you texturize the hair to make sure that everything blends. So now, as you're probably wondering, we're going to be starting to fade. As we're finally doing the razor fade. So, we've got our baseline here, and I know that this length I want to keep. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave about a comb's length below that baseline is where I'm going to set my zero line in the haircut. So I've got my baseline here. So if that's where it is. I'm going to go in. I'm going to start with pretty much a comb of distance. This will leave me more than enough space to make sure that I can get a smooth transition between the fade and the length in the part. So we're just going to set a smooth bald line there. The great thing with the comb's distance too is it actually, it's a little bit too much distance is you're going to end up with a really soft fade. And having a little bit of darkness in the fade actually creates a bit of geometry in the haircut because you have the silhouette of the hair following the profile on top, but you're also going to have a silhouette of the haircut on the side. So if your fade is just totally soft and light through, you're going to have no geometry. You're just going to have the shape on top. But this, not only does it give me, in my opinion, a bit of an old school feeling, but you also get this second silhouette where you can play with the length, how this interacts with the length on top. So this is really about how you build a haircut to include a fade rather than have a fade and then a haircut. And the reason I, I'm not punching the line in like this is I like that already I'm starting to, to fade the line. Is once, even as I'm approaching it, I'm not setting in a hard, hard line, but I'm still setting in a bit of a softer guideline. This is where using your mirror is such an important trick as well, is you want to make sure that not only does it look balanced from your eye, but when you look in the mirror, oh, too far, it looks balanced in the back when you look at it from a distance. The mirror is a great tool as well because you'll see not only what your fade looks like from the few centimeters you're away from it, but you will also see what the fade looks like to someone walking down the street. So you'll be able to see the hair and not only the distance between the customer and the mirror, but then the distance past the mirror as well. And this really makes sure that your haircut not only looks good to someone standing directly in front of them, but also someone who just sees your patron in passing. Okay, now that we've set our zero line, we're gonna go in and we're gonna bald out underneath it. So I'm gonna go in with my trimmer and I'm gonna start to fade out at zero. So again, this is with a scooping motion. You just want to drive not all the way up to the line because you are creating a fade. You want to leave a bit of distance, but you want to start to take away all of this hair. Scraping down a little bit into the sideburn. Now this might not look like it's a very high fade, but you have to keep in mind how much distance, especially this blonde hair, is going to stay light as it works up the head is we're not really going to be seeing darkness in the fade until probably about here. So even though the bald line is so low, this is still going to come up as a high fade, but it's going to be a high fade that's got a really nice blend to it. Just taking away this hair underneath. And really, you see that scooping motion because you really want to make sure you're not setting in a hard line with the trimmer, especially with the skeleton trimmer. This is so short and so sharp that it can be just a nightmare to be trying to get that line out on the floor. You'll be losing minutes you don't want to lose when you're working on a, a time schedule with your customers. Taking all that away. The trimmer is a little bit longer when you invert it than when you keep it flat to the skin too. So if you're having a hard time getting a little line out, just inverting your trimmer is going to be enough to make sure that you can really graduate into that line with your zero. also a great tool. Make sure that you're not using just the flat blade, but you're actually really using the corners. Because when you use the corners of your clipper, you're not only point cutting into the fade, which is the same way when you do it on top, create softness, but you're actually holding the blade at an angle to the skin. So if you're fading like this, it's all flat. But if you tilt the clipper, or the trimmer in this case, when you fade, you can see that right away, each tooth is a little bit longer than the last tooth. So the fading is easier because you physically have just that little tiny difference between each tooth as you scrape up through the haircut. And that can really make the difference when you're working in that 
difficult to fade darker hair. Around the ears. You really want to make sure when you're doing these razor fades too, you don't leave any of those fine, soft vellus hairs behind the ear because that can make a huge difference because they do all a nice bald skin and then, oh wow, there's long hair there. They'll feel the fuzz. Even if it's hard to see, they'll feel the fuzz. Make sure you get all that hair off. So now we're gonna go in with the shaver. We're going in with the shaver now. I like using the shaver because it's a little bit shorter than the straight razor. Is it really, you take away all of that hair, you get that transition all the way to the skin and you're really able to scoop with it. I think it's also a lot gentler on the skin. So especially in this kind of heat we're having right now, it's a lot nicer to have the shaver on the skin than to just be shearing away, uh, shaving away with the razor. Make sure you're using a light touch with this too. You'll notice when I'm doing the actual fading, I'm using just the one foil, but when I'm taking away bulk, like on the back of the neck, I'm using both the foils. Really making sure all this hair is gone to get that totally smooth transition into the skin. In there, the one foil, and you see it's that same pointing motion into the hair. And then with the shaver, you can also tap down a little bit to make sure you get that transition totally smooth. Getting the bulk away at the bottom of the hairline. Speaking up, shaving. Make sure you get all these hairs under the ear too. Because even if you're not doing a beard trim, taking this away really goes the extra mile for your face trim. And those are gonna be the little things that we really notice that you might do in your chair that another barber might not. So I'm gonna open up my clipper all the way and I'm gonna set another line about one centimeter up. Just like that. And this is going to be running parallel to both the baseline and the zero line I created. And once that's set, again with that scooping motion, I'm gonna close my clipper uh, about halfway and I'm gonna start using just a few of the teeth to fade that line out. So you see I'm really using that angle to the clipper and just to point cut that line out. Just closing it a little bit more as I work down that line. See at this point when I'm not setting a line, I always just use a few teeth on the clipper. This is gonna create the most diffused possible look to the fade. And you see, it's not a big scooping C-shape motion or a big scooping motion like this every time I do a fade, but it's this little rocking motion. And this is going to not put more weight in the fade. This is gonna make sure you're not taking the fade too high. Uh, you see where this dent is in the head, I'm really able to work into it. Because what you wanna do when you're creating a fade is not just cut an even length, but you want to create the illusion of a perfectly smooth skull. Is the same as when you're doing a haircut, is you do not want to see any dents in the skull, you don't want to see any roundness in the skull, is you're creating the illusion of a perfect skull. And that's so important in fading because fading isn't just about the length you cut the hair, it's about using the length at which the hair is to control how light passes through the hair and touches the scalp. So in finer hair versus uh, denser hair, in th or in thicker hair versus thinner hair, you're going to be doing different things in the fade to create a smooth appearance. And this is so important to consider not just the length, cutting it to an even length to get your fade, but to cut it into an even gradient. Because a fade is about fading, it's about gradients, it's about light. It's not just about length, it's about, when you're cutting a length, it's to manipulate how light passes through the hair. Now we're gonna to go to the one guard. I'm gonna open that all the way up, and I'm gonna set another line about a centimeter up. That is, yes. And now this line is, this line is not going to be as heavy as the previous line because it's very similar to the length the comb was set. And then we're just gonna do the exact same thing we did before, just with the corner of the clipper, closed a little bit more, just working underneath it. And now at this point, you wanna start getting the fade clean, but it's okay if there are little imperfections because we're gonna refine the whole fade once we've set in this basic shape at the end. Now the one guard's done, we're gonna go into half, open it up, 
and just keep working out that line between the one and the open bear clipper blade. So we've got a little bit of a line left there, but now we're going to be making that transition into the weight line at the base. So we're going to open it up. This is with the two guard on. And we're just going to be. And this one, because it's so long and I don't expect to be taking anything off, I am keeping the clipper square to the head. You can see nothing's really coming off there. This is using the two is more of just a, a cross check. It's just to make sure that now I know exactly how I can fade without taking anything. So now we're with the one and a half. Again, just really now we want to make sure that fade is getting totally smooth. You can see there's still some darkness in there, so we're going to be going back in with the one in a moment. So important too that not only are you looking at your fade, but you're really listening for when the hair's coming off to you. Your ears are just as important as your eye with this as a tool. Because certain times you think it's right and then you hear something and you know that the fade still needs a bit of work. Turn up the one, and we're just gonna refine the whole fade down now. By refining the fade down, as opposed to going back in and fading up again, we're making sure that the fade doesn't inch up on the haircut, as we're only taking away the darkness where it is, as opposed to driving the whole fade and lifting it higher and higher. So we've got this very high fade with this low bald line. It'll look out of balance. By doing it like this, you make sure the fade stays in balance and you're still able to keep that space to create that soft gradient. So now that the base of the fade is done with the clippers, I'm gonna go in and I'm just gonna refine some of the dark spots more with the, uh, the scissors. It's a little scissor over comb. I'm gonna start with the wide teeth of the comb for low tension. And then as I get to more and more detailed work on the fade, I'm going to do it with the fine teeth of the comb for a little bit higher tension on the hair. Just touch your head a little bit. Just go through like that. Just making sure to get everything as even as possible. Really control, because you want to make sure that even though there are no lines, there's almost this imaginary even plane to the fade. You can go through and you can point into it a little bit. Just take out a little darkness without removing any length. This preserves the shape, but takes out a little darkness in the fade. And then I'll go in with the blenders a little bit now, just to take out the last few dark spots. So that is the way I now do the fade. So all that's left is to blend this weight line uh, from the fade into the top. But I'm gonna do the rest of the fade first and then we're gonna come back to that. So now we're gonna start blending the weight line from the base, uh, from where we said the baseline into the fade with the top. So we're gonna start parallel with the blending shear over comb to do a kind of a cursory pass. And you can check it and see how much weight that relieves. Notice that I'm really on the last millimeter of hair. I know that the line's right. I just need to soften the line. I'm not taking any length away. I'm just softening that line. So, and then once you start to get into the longer lengths, not where that round of the head is, where the hair is so short, but once you start to get back towards this crown, not only are you looking for that connection, but you're looking to see where that weight really lives. So you can see that all that's blended, so that means that the weight is in here somewhere. So we'll make sure that hair is spread out smooth. Step, and you see, only taking a little hair away, and I'm pointing in the direction the hair wants to move. So you really wanna make sure that not only are you blending on the surface, but you're working to deep point cut along the length of the hair because this will help give it a Velcro texture 
that will help the hair lay back into shape. Got a little bit on the bottom. All that's nice and blended. So now we can work through this. You notice the scissor is almost parallel to the hair and it's just working in the direction I want the hair to move. So we get that nice flow towards the back. Taking a little extra weight out. This is gonna help give it that movement as well towards the back because you really want the hair to not just go straight down, but to flow towards the back a little bit. So the hair, you can use that wave and just the natural motion of the hair. So again, we're blending on that last little, you see that the hair coming out of that, I mean, it's like millimeters of hair, not even. I'm really on the surface. I'm not changing that line, just taking the weight out. And then as the hair gets longer, you look for where it's blended already. See, there's still a bit of weight in there. And then, so that's all blended. Oops, I'm sorry. Can work this between the fingers even. Lay it out. This is gonna help the hair velcro into shape. You wanna make sure that you're working almost totally parallel to the hair as well. This is also where it becomes really important to work with that color. So with the slicing, I'm trying to break up some of those highlights a little bit so that there's a more natural movement of the color through the hair. So this is all that hair that I connected down to the baseline. So I just wanna make sure all of this is blended properly. So you can even lift it 90 degrees out in between the fingers. You see how that hair wants to move. This is where body position is so important as well because you have to make sure to step away so you're almost totally plain there so you can really access deep into the hair without taking much out. And this creates a lot of movement towards the back which is so essential to creating these classic haircuts with some fullness still in the parietal ridge, because if they hang down too much, you'll end up with way too much weight and they'll come out bullish. And then you just start working through the cut, following along the previous sections you'd work with, and you just wanna to start to texturize those ends so that they have more grip. This is emulating actually a razor technique that was popular in the 50s for women's hair when they would create the massive beehive updos. They would work with the razor technique because it would not show any steps in the haircut. This was before precision haircutting was popular, but it would also grip the rollers really well. So the same way that that grips the rollers, this is actually gonna grip that pomade phenomenally. And again, it's so important that you work with the color of the person's hair as well. See, you can just lay that between the fingers. It's very heavy on the ends, but it's a straight line, so I don't need to go like that. So I can just go into the hair. Just to take a little bit out. I don't want to take too much though, because I know I also want to texturize for volume, which means I'm definitely going to be working a little bit lower on the hair strand as well. Once I get that basic Velcro put into the hair. As you can see, those are still, when I lift those up, that's still really full. I haven't thinned out the ends at all. I've just given them a bit more grip. Pull this down, because I really want this to move forward and stay full. I'm gonna go in while sliding out. Same here, in the fingers. Making sure it blends into that crown. See how I'm sliding out? 
because I don't want to be taking too much out here. And I want that to have a lot of movement to it. Blending it to that disconnection. You can see how smooth the flow in the cut is now. So now the hair is really grabbing itself. We've really got what could be a finished product. We're going to give it a little bit more. So we're going to start working through with some lower texture in the hair to create more lift. So you want all of your lift to come from in front of the apex. So I'm going to take a section and it's going to be a little bit in front of the apex. And now this is again where you want to check how the roots of the hair move. So look at this. Is that hair is really growing in that direction. So to create a little bit more volume, I'm actually going to push it this way. And I'm not gonna do this. You're gonna totally fuck it up if you do this. Just over the surface, I'm gonna take away, you can see it's like that much hair. Just over the surface. My scissors are not even laying on the comb. I'm taking off as little hair as I can while I do this. And this is just gonna put some short pieces in there to see how that already manipulates the natural fall of the hair is that hair is now moving in a different direction. That's moving more that direction now to create lift. But when I take that section up, it's still full on the ends. It's not thin. I haven't thinned the hair at all. I'm just giving it this almost channel-like texture. So I'm gonna move through the next section. Lift this back. You can see the hair is really growing that way. So again, I'm gonna push it this direction I'm just gonna go over the surface of the hair. I'm not in the hair, it's just the surface. You can also do this with your straight shears as well. So if this is something where you wanna get a really exaggerated effect, where the hair is really thick, so maybe towards the front where you really want even more lift to pop, you can go in, push that hair in the direction the, pretty much the opposite direction of how it's going to lay in the end. And just here you can also lift it up a little bit as well. And you can see how exaggerated that volume can get into that silhouette. Same thing here. This is just using, when you think about texture, is don't just think about texture as unevenness, but think about what texture can do in a haircut for you. How do you use short hair to influence the direction the long hair moves? Because the long hair is gonna be heavy, it's gonna lay down. The short hair is gonna be lighter, it's gonna stand up. So if you can put short hairs in the right places in between the long hairs, you're gonna be able to create more exaggerated shapes using the natural hair rather than just having to blow dry and create lift using that. Is this is a cut now that's not going to wash out of the hair the minute he steps into the shower. These are tricks that are going to stay in the hair no matter what happens. Cool, so all that's left now is we're going to razor in the parting. Now I know that this is, especially for new barbers, pretty much the scariest part. So I'm going to show you exactly how I do this. Is I will set the line with the trimmer like this and that'll be it. I'll take away pretty much just enough hair that I can get the razor on the scalp, and then I'll do the rest with the razor because it's a lot easier to fuck up quickly with this than it is with the razor. So make sure that parting is exactly where you want it to be because there's not a lot of give after this. I'm gonna set this line. Set the line. The line. Line. Cool. And that's all I'm going to do with the trimmer. 
The rest of it, I'm gonna be doing with a big tool. So I open that up, my new SCORM razor. And we're just right on that line, just gonna take it out. The thickness of the parting is totally dependent on the person's hair and the look you're really going for. For me, they, I like them a bit of an in-between width. Because I like them, if you're gonna razor a parting, like I want it to be seen, it should be commanding, especially in a haircut like this. But I also, you know, you don't want this channel cut into the hair. I like doing the razor too, with just no product or anything, just because I want as much resistance as I can, so I don't really fuck it up. Cool. So to do the final styling, I'm going to be using the white rusel. I've selected this for Martin's hair just because it'll emphasize that loose texture in the cut, giving it lots of hold, but especially because it's so hot out, it's not going to melt like one of the greases. I'm going to take just a little scoop of this between the hands. And especially when doing a high volume style, it's so important you just mostly get this down at the roots. This product's got a dry finish, so I don't need to get the ends shiny or anything. So, so much of this style is just going to come from that lift of getting it down at the roots. Really with my fingertips. And then when I style the hair for my customers, I always make sure to do it in the mirror because I want them to know exactly how I'm going to do this process. I like to cut away from the mirror, but the styling is all kind of about the cell with the product. So it's so important you do this face in the mirror. So I'm using a bit of my palms so I can slick that parting back. But on the top, I'm trying to keep those ends as clean as I can because it'll just make smoothing them out in the style a lot easier. Excellent. There we go. So now the product is evenly through the hair. You can already see that texture and that kind of roughness at the roots doing its job to create that lift. So I'm gonna go through. I'm gonna start to pick it out into the style. I'm going to tilt his head forward a little bit. And just start lifting that hair out. When a customer has their head tilted forward, you're actually using gravity to help you create the style as well, because that hair is going to be able to fall forward and create the roundness, rather than having to constantly be pulling it up and fighting gravity. So especially with a razor fade, you do not want to forget to put some aftershave on the customer just because there is so much shaved skin. I like the Rusal one because of the castor oil, so it really helps the skin recover and get that nice burn with it. The Rusal aftershaves are all designed to match the scents of the Rusal products too, so there's no concern about whether or not the aftershave smell is going to clash with the product smell. There we go. Wow. It's fucking yeah. amazing. Super cool. There we go, man. Thanks, man. For sure, man. Oh, I thought that was the end. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.